Last time we were together, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit through our series, Spirit and Fire. We were talking about the need for us to pursue after God and pursue after the presence of God in order to become the movement He's called us to be. In this series, Jesus in the Digital Aid, we're trying to figure out how do we take that, that power, that, that, that manifestation of the presence of God and apply it to our context, to our world in this digital era, in a world, especially now uh, during this pandemic that has really primarily existed virtually. For that, I want to look at two people and their advice. The first one being Paul, the apostle, who comes in later in the story of Jesus and tries to help con contextualize the story of Jesus for a new age, for a, 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 a new people, I would say. He takes the story of the Jewish Jesus and, and really wraps it up, repackages it to put it to the Gentiles. And the word Gentiles uh, is often um, looked upon as other peoples, as if people who are not believers. But really, it's talking about other nations. It's talking about those who did not grow up in the Jewish culture, the Jewish identity, and the Jewish understanding. So Paul is repackaging Jesus for a world that is outside of Judaism. And and, and, and it, I think through reading and listening and hearing Paul, we can try to understand how do we take Jesus, how do we take what Jesus was trying to do and repackage it for our world, for our time, and in our context. The second person we're going to look at is Jesus himself. Who did he say he was? Who is he? Who is Jesus is the question we're trying to explore. And what does it mean to follow him? And then if we can understand those two things, we can then try to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus in our current world, in this digital age. So let's look at Paul's advice when it comes to uh, the believers that are in Rome and what it means for them to follow Jesus and how they can live um, a life of discipleship in the midst of a world that did not truly recognize their movement or recognize the value that their movement had. Romans chapter 12, I want you to read it with me. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want to do a slight modification here to Paul's context, to Paul's conversation with the Roman church. Uh, I want to share with you that Paul is saying, hey guys, take this spiritual conversation, this idea that you have in theory, and apply it to your physical world. Apply it to the real, tangible world that you're living in. He's saying that often we, we, we take these um, conversations about spirituality, especially uh, for the people in Rome, especially for those who are used to discussing different philosophies and different ideologies that they could, it could kind of stay here in the theory box and never become real in their natural world. And so Paul is saying, hey, present your bodies, present your life, present your tangible life back to Jesus. And so I would like to modify it and say this. Here's how I read this text in our world, in our time. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in in view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done for you, in view of what he's accomplished in your life, in view of how he's led you so far, in view of what he's done for you, in view of who he is to you, to offer your social media platform, your Twitter account, your Instagram account, your Facebook account, offer your social media platform as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Paul is saying, take what you've learned here and apply it here. Take what you've learned from the physical, phys take what you learned from the spiritual world and apply it in the physical. And so here I'm, I'm saying that if we take that same verse and say, here's who we are, here's what Jesus has called us to do. Here's what our life looks like when we come to church. Does it reflect what happens on our social media platform? what happens in our digital world. It, 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 are you who you are behind the screen? We find that we live in an era that people uh, would say things behind the screen that they wouldn't say to each other in person. They would behave a certain way behind the screen that they wouldn't behave that same way in person. I think this idea of social media, the, the world that you and I live in, causes us to kind of live double lives. We live one life in person and we live a totally different life in the real world. We, we have followers in the virtual world that we never talk to in the real world. We have friends in the virtual world that we don't connect with in the real world. We, we have ideas and philosophies and thoughts in the virtual world that doesn't exist in the real world. And now, especially in this era, especially in these past few weeks, we've seen what has happened, what has occurred, the power and the influence of the social media world, what happens, what goes viral cause a catalyst, a movement that can transform society and transform the conversation. And so when we're talking about following Jesus in this digital world, we're saying, how are we going to utilize the influence and the platform that we have? How do we interact? How do we deal with the world that exists virtually? How do we follow Jesus in that world? How do we stay the same? in our pursuit of God behind the screen. So if we're looking at Paul's advice, he simply says to take what you are, take who you are, present your bodies, or present your social media platform, or present who you are virtually, present it to God as a living sacrifice. Now, I know you've heard several messages on this before, and you've probably heard it in some different places. This idea of living sacrifice means that it is alive to God, but it is dead to you. That means it's no longer about your agenda and your priorities and your thoughts, but it's made making room for God's agenda, God's priorities, God's thoughts. So a living sacrifice is something that I'm constantly having to say to myself, not my will, but your will be done. A living sacrifice is where I'm constantly having the conversation and the battle as to who makes the decisions, who has the priority, myself or God, who, who forms and drives my philosophies in life. Is it the kingdom? of God or is it the kingdom of this world? And that's why Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your social media platform as a living sacrifice, pleasing to God, holy, separate, other, can't look the same, and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That is, my worship is not the music that I sing. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it's important that Paul is saying here, Worship is what I do. Worship is how I behave. Worship is how I act. Worship is what I do with my life. Worship is my behavior outside of the praise and worship moment. That's what my worship looks like. It's not the songs I sing. It's not when I'm gathered together and I'm singing music. That is not the worship God is looking for. He's looking for people who worship in spirit and in truth. That means their entire lives are given over to God. And Paul says here, if I present my real life, my body, all that I am, and I'm saying if I present who I am virtually to God, that is worship. Let's face it, we spend the majority of our time behind the screen whether it's on the phone, whether it's on television, whether it's on computers, whether it's in social media. Who are we behind the screen? And whose agenda are we carrying out behind the screen? And who is getting the most influence through our platform? Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of 
this world. <laughs> now, now, now let, let, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that is incredibly difficult um, to do when we're talking about the digital space. That is incredibly difficult to do when we're talking about the social media because when you're on these screens, when you're behind these thoughts, when you're behind these ideas, it's very easy to repost, share, and get involved in conversations that per perhaps don't originate from us, but we feel pressured to get connected into them. And Paul is saying here, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't let the world around you tell you how to engage. Rather, present yourself to God in such a way that you're constantly being transformed by his kingdom, by his image, so that who the world sees is Jesus before they see Jose. Jesus before they see Burwood Church. Jesus before they see any of us. That our world virtually should reflect our priority when it comes to God. Our social world, our virtually social world, social media should be communicating who we are as kingdom citizens through our actions, through what we decide to engage in. Here, Paul is saying that everything changes, everything flows out of who we are, our thoughts and our ideas, and, 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 and that's where renewing takes place, replacing one thought over the other, replacing one idea over the other. The thought and the idea that I want to push through is who is Jesus? I think that's the thing that renews our mind. Jesus is the restorer. Jesus is the transformer. Jesus is the one that should drive who we are and Jesus is the passion that we should take on. Paul says, when I've given my life over, my digital life over to Christ, when I've given over my digital world to the influence of the kingdom of God, and when I've decided to make what's theory become real for me and constantly renewing my mind by putting Jesus over any other thought, any other platform, any other campaign, when I allow Jesus to be the driving force of my life, he says, then I will be able to approve. Look at this. Then I will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, Paul is saying, unless I make Jesus the center of my living, unless I'm willing to give over all of my thoughts, all of my ideas, unless I'm willing to take my platform and surrender it back to God, unless who I am behind the screen is the same person I am physically, then I won't be able to truly know what God's will is for my life. And we're talking about God's will. We're not talking about what career choice we're called to make or, 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 or what job we're supposed to take or who I'm supposed to marry. We're just talking about the day-to-day, -day, everything th that God has planned for us. We won't be able to capture all of it if I'm not surrendering all of me. Let me say that again. If I'm not surrendering all of me, I will not capture all of God's plan for my life. That is, God is constantly engaging in conversation with us. God is constantly wanting to share who he is and what he's thought about us. But he's saying, if I'm not constantly testing, hey, God, here's what I was thinking of doing. Is this a good idea? Here's what I was thinking of doing. Is this a good idea? Here's what I'm thinking of posting. Is this a good idea? Here's what I'm thinking of sharing. Is this a good idea? Here's what I'm thinking of emailing. Is this a good idea? And, and here's the thing. I know it sounds foolish, but this is how David led his life. David was constantly going, should I go to this campaign? Should I go to this war? Should I do this? Should I do that? He was speaking to a very real God. And he was engaging God in every single area of his life. And in this world that we live in, in this digital era, have we completely taken God out of that world? I find that there are people who claim that they're committed to Christ, but their social media influence, their digital influence, what I decide to look at, what I decide to put in front of my screen looks very different than the commitment I've made to Jesus. 
And so we're going to take a few weeks to unpack this. We're going to take a few weeks to unpack what it means to follow Jesus in this new era, in this world where there are constantly, we are constantly bombarded by several different messages that we feel that we need to engage with and connect with. And here's what I'm trying to say to you. Is the kingdom of God what pushes your influence in the digital world? Is that what drives how you interact in the digital world? Jesus has something to say about that. Let's look at what Jesus says he is as he comes out of the desert, having been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's just starting his ministry. Let's look at who he claims to be. It says, Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Remember, we talked about the need for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Ooh, okay, so, so Jesus went viral the minute he came back to Galilee. Jesus was being talked about in, in every single conversation throughout the countryside. So in that in that medium where it was word of mouth conversation and communication was happening through word of mouth, stories about Jesus was being shared all over. And it says in verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues. He had conference appointments. He was a speaker, known guest speaker in this place and that place. He was going viral. Everyone was praising him. <laughs> I can't imagine the amount of TikTok followers he would have had or the amount of Instagram followers he would have had. Every single person was, go was wowed about who he was. Watch this, watch this. When I surrender my life to the Spirit of God, God will lift up the power of my influence because now I've matched it with the kingdom of God. In other words, I have partnered with God's kingdom. Therefore, God says, I can use you and he will increase favor on you. Jesus is now being talked about in every platform. He's being spoken about in every conversation. And everyone is praising him. Now watch this. Watch what happens. So now he's gotten the influence. Are you watching? Are you watching? He's gotten the influence. He, he's grown the followers. He's gotten a lot of people talking about him. He now has a platform. Everywhere he goes, he's being spoken about. People are asking him, come speak here. Come speak there. Come speak there. Uh, this is what many people dream of. Influencers, uh, social media architects. These, there, there are people, you know, cult, cultural architects. There are people who, who dream of this, who are having, want to have so many followers, want to have a platform. And look what Jesus does with his platform. Look what Jesus does with his platform. He's gotten a lot of people to follow him. He, he's, he's, he's being requested to talk in every single place. So he walks in, I guess, to one of his guest lecturing conversations. He walks into the synagogue. He's a guest speaker. Uh, he, he, they, they give him a platform. He's coming in, and look what he does. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And I'm sure people are, you know, they're, they're coming like, man, everyone's talking about this guy. We watched him grow up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. You see, everyone's ready. He's got the platform. He's got the audience. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> Jesus walks in to the synagogue and he picks up one of the verses 
that I'm sure has long been forgotten. And he uses his platform to lift up an agenda that most would find underwhelming. He lifts up an agenda that, at least for the religious leaders, would not be something they would like to hear. He speaks about lifting up the faces of those who have been ashamed, lifting up the, the, the lives, the statuses of those who've been cast out, the prisoners, the poor, those who have no say or status in society. Jesus uses his platform not to increase the affluence of others or leaders, but the influence of those who are disadvantaged and overlooked. How are you using your influence? How are you using your influence? The church of God, the church of the living God, the church of Jesus should be using their influence the same way Jesus used his influence. To lift up the voices of the unheard. To lift up the voices of those who've been oppressed. To lift up the voices of those who've been cast out. To lift up the voices of those who have been forgotten. To lift up the voices of those who are not heard. Jesus walks into this synagogue and he says, Today, if you want to know who I am, I am the guy whose ministry is going to be about restoring those who are broken. Today, you are seeing this fulfilled today. This is what God is about. He's about restoring the broken. As disciples of Jesus in our world, our influence, who we are, is meant to lift each other up.